Welcome everyone to the January 21st professional VMware.com V Brown Bag. We're continuing on with our DevOps series tonight and we're going to be talking Docker with James Turnbull. So we just have some quick show notes. Um, you can join in on the conversation using the V Brown Bag hashtag. You can also use uh, the GoToMeeting window to ask any of your questions or leave comments. Remember we also have other podcasts going on globally, so check those out. You can also download the shows via iTunes or directly from professionalvmware.com. Our guest speaker tonight is James Turnbull at Qatar on Twitter. I'm your host, Ahmad Yunus. You can find me at Ahmad Yunus uh, on Twitter as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to James. Excellent. There you go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can I just confirm uh, that you can see the slides there? Yes. Working? Yep. Okay, excellent. So this is our introduction to Docker, and I'm going to talk about containerization, uh, and we, uh, I've stolen uh, the docker.com uh, subtitle here, which is Containerization is the New Virtualization. Just really quickly, I'm the VP of Engineering at the crowdfunding startup Kickstarter. I'm an advisor at Docker and I was a fairly early employee at Docker when uh, the product was being released. Uh, prior to that, um, I was an early engineer who worked on Puppet, uh, which is a configuration management tool, and I've been in the IT industry doing various things for about 20, 25 years. I work heavily in open source space, uh, responsible for, for a bunch of open source code, and if you can hear, I have a funny accent. I'm Australian, um, so if you, uh, you find it a bit of a struggle to understand me, uh, please jump in with a question or something like that, and I will try and uh, make things a bit clearer. Uh, in addition to the other things I do, uh, I wrote a book called The Docker Book. It's one of about seven technical books that I've written, and this is really a, a very introductory text. It tells you a bit about Docker, explains how it works, uh, and takes you right through from absolute beginner to a reasonably sort of advanced sort of user. Uh, the book is available for sale at the URL there or, or via Amazon or in various other places, like Barnes and Noble and all that sort of stuff. So um, I have a little bit of an insight into who you guys are. Um, I, I, I've talked a little bit with the, the team about, um, uh, about who, you, who you folks are. In a more interactive space, I would, uh, I would ask more questions. But most of the people who tend to be interested in Docker fall into two big camps and they tend to be either sysadmins or developers. And the really interesting thing about Docker is that both groups tend to be interested in the technology, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. So what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about two things, really. I'm going to be talking about Docker and, and why you should care about it. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a demo uh, and show you a couple of different Docker things at work. Um, as with all of these things, I, I, I do warn you up front that uh, like you're working with children, animals and live demos, uh, things are, can go wrong. Uh, so uh, everything worked perfectly before I give the presentation, which means it's almost certainly guaranteed not to work during the presentation. But you should get an idea of how Docker works and, and a bit of understanding. Second thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, another tool called Fig, which uh, the Docker team is about to rename to Docker Compose. And it's like a little stack builder, and it's a way you actually build whole applications out of Docker. And I'll sort of give you sort of an idea of the sort of a very simple developer workflow that someone might undertake with Docker. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about architecture and about why Docker changes the way you do certain things in your organization. So what is Docker? So Docker is container virtualization. I'm, I'm gathering from the, the VMware thing that most of you are familiar with virtualization, and you're probably intimately with, with what, what's called hypervisor virtualization. And you all know hypervisor virtualization, you know, you have a bare metal box, you install a hypervisor on top of it, um, and then you run virtual machines on top, which, you know, essentially uh, the hypervisor provides an abstraction or an intermediary layer between um, the hardware resources you're sharing between the virtual machines. Each virtual machine has a guest operating system and then your application and so forth. Docker is a little bit different. It's what's called operating system level virtualization, which means that it relies on technology in the operating system specifically uh, components of a Linux kernel, to be able to, to, be able to uh, run containers. And uh, what, how this works is that um, inside, uh, as opposed to having the hypervisor, um, the Docker daemon takes the place of the hypervisor 
and represents a very, very thin layer, an abstraction layer between uh, a, a little container, uh, which is kind of like a little micro VM, uh, and the operating system, the machine underneath it. So, uh, as you'd imagine, there's some, some things that are a bit different about that, and we'll talk about you know what, what the, the differences and limitations are. Um, so, container virtualization has been around for a little while, um, and really, uh, the reason that Docker has has become so popular and it's been so interesting um, is really about lifecycle. So the Docker team uh, came from a sort of heavy background in infrastructure software, um, particularly in the cloud and platform as a service space and infrastructure as a service space. Uh, we're all, uh, the people at Docker were generally all a mix of sort of developers and sysadmins, what traditionally sort of has, been, has become now known as sort of DevOps sort of people. So we all wrote code, but we also sort of managed infrastructure at various points in our careers. And one of the biggest challenges we identified was the process by which you have a developer who has some code on their machine, and that code really doesn't have any value until it gets run on a bit of production infrastructure, or until it's tested, or until it sort of gets into the life cycle. So if you're a developer, uh, and, and you work for the business, and you develop an application, the business wants to see you get that code off your laptop, or your computer, or your test server, and move it through the life cycle you know, into testing, um, pre-staging, um, deployment and then production as fast as possible. Uh, and that's a really hard challenge. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, the first one is that uh, quite frequently a lot of organizations, the, the environments that you develop code in, that you build applications in, don't actually look like the production environment. Uh, for, for a number of reasons, your test environment may not have the same versions of software, uh, it may not have the same infrastructure, it may not have, have the same services, Sometimes it, is, it doesn't even have the same operating system. I know a lot of developers who develop locally on their machines using a very different environment or using a local VM that looks very different from the production server where the code's ultimately going to run. So Docker is designed to, to try and make this workflow a bit simpler and a bit easier. So what it's designed to do is that um, it's very easy for a developer to take an image, a, a, a Docker container, uh, and run their application in it. When they're happy with how the application looks, they can take that Docker container and they can move it from the test environment or the, or the dev environment into a staging environment or into production. And how this works is that the Docker daemon uh, provides you with that abstraction layer and it provides you with that layer that basically means that it doesn't matter what's running underneath because what's running on top is a Docker container. So it doesn't really care about the, the operating system and I'll talk a little bit about operating systems and what, what's supported in a moment doesn't really care about the underlying operating system. All it's really interested in is that the Docker daemon can act as that abstraction layer and run the VM. So you can imagine it's a little bit like uh, a somewhat more lightweight version of um, vMotion with a lot more sort of, uh, at this moment, it's, it's probably a little bit, a bit more cumbersome than vMotion, but it's, it's a very much like that. You can move containers around, start, run them. So um, Essentially what you're looking at is a build once model. Your developers can build an image uh, which, from which you can run containers. You can ship that image around to different places uh, and then you can update it and, and uh, run it in many places. So we have a number of people who use Docker. Uh, they run a Docker environment locally on a, in a dev test environment, but their deployment environments may include physical data centers, uh, machines running VMware or vSphere, uh, it might include Amazon in the cloud, might include platform as a service like Cloud Foundry, and might include infrastructure as a service like OpenStack. So it doesn't matter to us what the underlying infrastructure is, as long as there's a Docker daemon that can run on it, you can run a Docker container, which makes your applications very, very portable. So building on top of this, what we decided to do was we, we, build, we built a uh, an isolated container that runs an application. Uh, we built it in a way that well, we, we use a technology um, called copy on write to build layers. So it requires, essentially it's a, uh, you know, if you're building a Docker, can, Docker image, you're building layers of file systems on top of one another. And each file system represents a change you've made to that image. So instead of having a monolithic virtual machine that with the several hundred megabytes of space, what happens is you have a very lightweight file system that the container runs from, and each that that file system is very carefully sliced into layers, 
where each layer represents only the changes that have been made to it to that image. So essentially, you get a you know a much much smaller, much much compact object. And if you want to make a change, like for example, deploying a new version of an application or a new set of code, you put a new layer on top of the file system, and only that new code is added. It doesn't change anything underneath. Um, it's also very standardized. So you know, essentially, I talked about before about it doesn't matter what the underlying infrastructure is, as long as you can run a Docker daemon, uh, what an image or a container created on a on a Docker daemon in a particular environment can be run in some other environment. And uh, it's very we're very careful to maintain API backwards compatibility to allow you to sort of move across versions very easily. Uh, we're also very contact contact agnostic. We don't really care what you run your stack on. What we care about is your application. So. Uh, you know, a lot of PaaS systems, for example, are very PHP centric or Ruby centric or Java centric. We don't really care. All we care about is exposing the elements of your application, like your web service or your API or your HTTP protocol or what happens to be the underlying infrastructure. We don't we don't really have a, a preference about that, or we don't force you to form a particular architecture. So some of you are probably saying at this point this isn't a new technology, and you're quite right. Um, Docker containers uh, come from a long heritage of, of, of lightweight operating system virtualization. So it dates back to the 70s and 80s with um, those of us who are old enough to remember logical partitioning um, on IBM mainframes um, and uh, things like Solaris zones uh, in the Solaris world. And more recently, uh, LXC, which was a Linux container technology that sort of uh, that, that, that five or six years old, um, 10 years old maybe now, um, that's available on Linux. The difference between those technologies and Docker is really that workflow element. So Docker is, is designed to be very easy for someone to use. Uh, previous things like LXC is quite a complex technology. Solaris zones required you to be quite a skilled sysadmin. Uh, Docker is designed to be able to be used so that a developer can create an image uh, and manage that image and ship it around and do things with it with very little assistance. So why should you care? You can think about Docker containers pretty much like packages. They're very lightweight, they're very simple, they're very small. It's essentially like building your application into a package and shipping it around, except you actually get a runtime as well. So it's a package that runs. Uh, I talked a bit about the portability, um, and essentially it, it, because you get that runtime part, it is a bit like a VM, but there are some differences. Um, the key difference is that containers boot considerably faster. Because you're sitting directly on top of the operating system, most containers launch, as in the application runs, in a sub-second time. So uh, I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes uh, how a container launches and how you can work with one. Um, but it's a very fast process. They have very little overhead. They sit directly on top of the operating system. The Docker daemon is very lightweight. Um, and because you're sitting directly on top of the file system, and directly on top of the CPU and the memory, um, you get near native performance. And uh, I know for many people that's a challenging thing to think about, um, that you're getting sort of near bare metal um, issues, performance rather. Uh, but uh, there's an IBM research paper that a gentleman named Bowden Russell wrote that you can look up online. And he provides a bunch of uh, comparisons against virtual machines where containers were often 20 times faster. Uh, they're very cloud and VM compatible. They can run on top of a, a virtual machine as well as on top of a cloud, as well as on top of bare metal, obviously with varying performance characteristics. There are a couple of key differences. Uh, I, a container is not a virtual machine. Uh, it represents, uh, uses some Linux kernel technology uh, to represent, um, uh, you know, it has a, a network domain, a CPU domain, a process domain, and things like that. It is not a guest operating system. Um, and you can very, you know, you are essentially, uh, it is much easier to punch holes in the walls of a container than it is to punch holes in a virtual machine. Uh, it is not a true um, guest operating system with a whole, all of that bells and whistles. It is a, a set of, um, uh, you know, namespaces um, and, and resources available on top of a, an operating system. So the reason this has become uh, really powerful and, and useful to people is that it creates this sort of really useful separation. Uh, everything that happens inside the container, the application, the developer can care about that. Um, Ops cares about the outside of the container, which is essentially, um, you know, its its availability, 
um, its connections to other containers, its networking configuration and things like that. Um, so you can create that sort of uh, much more clear uh, distinction between if something breaks, you know inside the container you know it's an, an application problem. If something breaks outside the container or you need to monitor something or control some setting, then that's really an operations issue. Uh, developers like it because it's very clean, it's very portable and very simple. So if you can build an application using the right set of dependencies um, and all you're exposing to the outside world is the API or the service you're making available, uh, you don't need to worry about deploying your code on a machine where the wrong version of the application is running or a different um, combination of stack is available or a different job, set of Java libraries or a different set of packages or a different operating system version. As long as the Docker daemon can run on that machine, all you are running is the service or the application you're making available to people. So you no longer have that worry about dependency. Uh, and it also encourages good architecture. It very much encourages a microservices model, very much encourages a, uh, a service-oriented architecture. Uh, and for a lot of developers who are get, trying to get towards that goal of a more service-oriented architecture, this naturally pushes them into the same view. For a lot of operations people, um, the big thing for them is it makes a life cycle more efficient. Uh, a classic example of this is that if you're a sysadmin and you're used to providing test environments for developers, uh, you know, you're probably used to getting the, the help desk ticket that says the developers need three new virtual machines and one of them needs to be configured as a database and another one needs to be middleware, another one needs to be the web service. Um, and you end up with a lot of virtual machines. Um, you end up uh, having to spend a lot of time configuring them and managing them. And those virtual machines really, they're test boxes. They're not, they're not, they're not sort of part of your core job. Um, and to be honest, developers rarely ask you to shut them down when they're finished with them and you end up with a bunch of sprawl of virtual machines, various states of assembly and various states of testing um, that make it hard for, for you to manage the environment. Uh, one of the customers I first started dealing with Docker one of the sysadmins called me and said, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm interested in Docker because uh, you know, a couple of months ago, one of our developers called and said, I want a really big virtual machine. So I gave it to him um, and uh, then they stopped asking for virtual machines. And uh, I was really worried. I thought something had gone wrong and the project had stalled. Um, so I went and asked them why they hadn't asked for virtual machines for several weeks. And the, the development team said that they'd run, installed Docker, the Docker team, and, on this very big virtual machine, and now they were self-serving Docker containers with their applications in them. They no longer had to go and ask operations to get a, a virtual machine or to get a test instance. They were building their own test instances, and they built a small web application to sit in front of Docker to do the provisioning piece and the deprovisioning, but they were now self-sufficient and, and no longer required intervention from operations. And the operations team was able to focus on the things that were really important to them, which is the availability and performance of the applications that deliver value to your customers. And I think that, that story is really interesting because it's one of the classic problems in IT. You are, you are dividing your time between things that, that don't necessarily have a huge material impact on the bottom line and things that do. Um, and you, know, you have uh, customers with very different demands and customers with very different expectations. This allows you to provide um, a, something where developers can take control of their destiny to some extent, they can stop waiting for you to build machines and you can stop worrying about them uh, you know, putting you under some SLA and you can focus on the things that make the, the most profit, which is making and running your applications. Uh, Docker containers, as I said, they also just present the application, so they eliminate inconsistencies. Um, you are no longer having to worry about entropy, um, you no longer worry about you have a built container that serves out your application. You don't have to worry about upgrading a, a software package on that machine and then discovering that you've broken an application because the developer has, has uses a different dependency. And as I said, they support a really strong feeling of segregation of duties. So um, what can I use Docker for? Uh, the classic examples we've seen where, as Docker has become popular is continuous integration and continuous delivery. Docker, because it has that workflow, it allows you to move very fast. So if you're building test environments, you're running tools like Jenkins, where you're running constantly tests and you, you have to you know, blow the machine away and start again, um, if you can cut out the time, the build time for a virtual machine, the start time for a virtual machine, and the shutdown time for a virtual machine, and replace that with a Docker container that launches in sub-second time, uh, 
shuts down in sub-second time and can be rebuilt in a matter of, of, of a small number of minutes, um, you can significantly reduce the time it takes you to test and move through that part of your continuous deliveries lifecycle. Uh, packaging deploying applications. Uh, Docker is a very good packaging system for applications. It allows you to ship things around and become very portable. Uh, Docker is also the basis of a large number of people building PaaS solutions. Um, so platform as a service is a very attractive model for Docker. Um, and it's very easy to build a small um, platform as a service just using Docker and some simple tools that are available out there. Or you can go for very sophisticated things and use tools like Cloud Foundry or OpenStack which have Docker support in them. Uh, and there's a tool from Google called Kubernetes that allows you to do sort of scheduling and stack building and a bunch of other sort of sophisticated stuff. Um, and uh, that's a tool that Google has open sourced. You may not realize this, but you've probably used a container before because pretty much all of Google services run in containers and they launch about two billion containers a week. Um, and you can deploy applications at hyperscale. As I said, that two billion containers a week, uh, you know, the reason they went with containers is because they're extremely cost effective um, and they, they allow you to pack as much compute onto a machine as possible. Because there's no overhead of the hypervisor, and obviously that's going to vary on different systems and different usages there. But you can pack a lot of containers onto a physical machine and, and you can get the most bang for your buck out of your capital expenditure on hardware. Uh, this also works with things like Puppet and Chef. Um, it's a less sort of, it, it can consider building a Docker container as being a bit like doing configuration management, but a lot less complex. Uh, I talked earlier about the fact that Docker images uh, are layers and you create those layers that, that um, uh, copy on write change process. Um, Docker image is also version controlled. You can think about Docker image as a bit like having a version control system for your infrastructure, except smaller, very self-contained and very lightweight. So if, you use, if you're in an environment that uses something like Puppet Chef or another configuration management tool, then Docker will fit very simply into your workflow. We'll talk a little bit about the technology stack. Hey James. Um, it runs on most Linux distributions, I think almost all of them. Yep. If you don't mind me interrupting, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so one of them is, so with containers, aren't you at the risk of ending up with extremely fragmented micro environments, everyone with its own Linux version, Apache version, etc.? Not really because they're so fast to rebuild that um, like, so what, what, here's, a, here's a classic example. So I would take uh, my Puppet module for installing Apache. Um, I would then build a Docker image with that Puppet module um, and uh, deploy that as my, as my image. Um, I then you know, uh, can provide a, you know, that image to my development team and they can develop on that. If I want to upgrade that image, then I just rebuild the image and it's a matter of, because it's copy on write, if I install the next version of Apache, that's the only files that will get changed in that image, which means it's very fast to do. And we'll see, I'll try and demonstrate that in the, the demo. Uh, as a result, you're not rebuilding a whole virtual machine. You're not doing, um, you know, you're not doing large scale configuration management. You're not pushing around um, large gigabytes of, of things. You're pushing around a very lightweight, simple Docker image. Okay. Well, it looks like the next question you're actually going to answer on this slide, so. Okay, um, so Docker, um, Docker runs natively on Linux primarily. So uh, because it is operating system virtualization, uh, you do not have the guest operating system, which means you can't do things like you know, uh, a Linux uh, operating system on, the, on the, the bare metal and a Windows operating system in Docker. It has to be something that, that shares a kernel between the, 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 whatever the operating system at the bare metal is and whatever is on top. Um, so it runs natively in uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, it's supported by Red, RHEL from, uh, in RHEL from version 7. Um, with, uh, you can, if you can persuade Red Hat, they will also probably support it on RHEL 6. Um, it's supported in all the Ubuntu distributions and Debian, um, you know, Gen 2, SUSE, you know, pretty much every flavor of, of, of Linux you can imagine. Um, we have a tool called Boots of Docker, uh, and then we shortly a new tool called Docker Machine. Um, which allows you to run Docker on top of OS X, um, and this is a very common environment for a lot of developers, and on top of Windows. Essentially what it does is it runs Docker inside a very, very small virtual machine um, and allows you to, because Docker is written in Go, 
you can natively build the, the client side of, of Docker in OS X and Windows and then connect to the server side running inside our little virtual machine on top of Windows. That allows you to, to create that Windows environment. Um, Microsoft has announced that, that um, I don't know what the time frame is, but they've made it pretty clear that native support for Docker will be available at, at some point. Um, I don't quite know how that's going to look or, or how they're going to do it. Um, I, I, if you have a, um, if you do work with Microsoft, then I said recommend you, you talk to the team, either the Azure team who are building that in the cloud stuff or talking to the platform team who are building that on top of the environment um, or possibly someone at VMware. I'm not intimately familiar with how this is, how this is, this is currently progressing, but they've made it pretty clear that, that they'd like to see a native Docker environment. Um, and I think that's pretty exciting. Um, and as I mentioned, yeah, it uses Linux kernel features, so it does require, it's a very Linux-centric solution right now. So you've spun up some more questions. Um, first of all, sure. how secure are containers? So um, we, containers are not virtual machines. I'll be upfront and say that. Um, but uh, they represent a, a reasonably secure deployment mechanism. And, and why reasonably secure, I suggest that what we say to people is, don't run root level processes inside containers. That's good practice anyway. You shouldn't run root level services inside your Unix boxes or Linux boxes. Um, we recommend that you demarcate your applications by risk profile. So you know you don't run your mission critical backend database server on the same Docker host as you run all of your customer facing web services. That you actually you know choose like workloads with like risk profiles and deploy them that way. We also recommend you use things like SE Linux and AppArmor. We, we provide profiles and um, Red Hat provides uh, policy out of the box that supports SE Linux. And SE Linux allows you to lock down your containers um, and allow, you know, prevent things like you know, your, your container can only access this part of the, you know, this, this, they only perform these particular actions. And those of you familiar with, with um, things like uh, Mac managed access control, things like SE Linux realize they're, they're very powerful and really you know, configurable. Um, Docker is also very configurable from a security point of view. You can do things like tell Docker it can only use certain resources, it can only use certain networks, um, all of that sort of stuff is configurable inside it. But it is not a true virtual machine. Uh, if you run a root level process inside a Docker container, it is very easy to punch out of the container and reach the host below. Hence why we apply these other security controls. Okay. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on hyperscale? Can you clarify? Sure. Um, so looking out there is that, and, and this is a this can be a controversial topic for many people. Um, uh, essentially, what happens is the Docker daemon is a very lightweight process. Um, on the, some of the large boxes I run, it sort of occasionally gets up to one percent of the of the CPU and memory of the box. Um, uh, my hypervisors, on the other hand, can sort of float around 5 to 15% depending on what they're doing. Uh, if I'm a, uh, a large environment like, um, uh, we'll say a lot, of, a lot of financial services institutions and things like that, I'm doing a lot of capacity planning based around packing the most number of virtual machines I can on a bit of physical hardware and getting every single dollar out of my, my value there. Um, so we're seeing a lot of Docker being deployed um, at, at that sort of, you know, where we can pack more Docker containers on top of, a, you know, more Docker workloads than we can virtual machines because we get that 5 or 10% of the hypervisor back. We're also seeing a lot of people who do, um, you, know, uh, you know, high performance computing, um, people who are, for example, doing things like uh, biometrics workloads, um, sorry, uh, bioinformatics workloads, um, pharmaceutical um, and, and scientific analysis, uh, financial trading, and things like that. Um, they want to get every you know you they they most often in those environments they're aiming to pack the most number of compute nodes as possible onto a single machine, and and you know cluster them together as much as possible. Uh, we have a number of people who are looking at replacing their existing high performance computing systems with Docker based containers because it's considerably faster. Uh, there's at least uh, a couple of government laboratories, for example, that have um, largely ripped out their existing high-performance computing tools. And those who are familiar with high-performance computing know the technology hasn't changed very much in the last sort of 
five to ten years. Um, so they're very excited about the fact that they're able to add a workflow as well as get a bit more bang for their buck. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Docker Basics. Um, and I, I've sort of thrown a few of these words at you. I'm going to try and define them a bit better. Um, so what happens when you build a, uh, what we call, the basis of Docker is what we call an image. And the image is essentially uh, a collection of commands that, that uh, install software, configure files, make settings, open up ports, configure networks, things like that. So essentially it's a, it's a little script and it's contained in a file we call the Docker file. And it basically is a set of instructions for building your application. So it might say things like, you know, install this pack, based, you know, build an Ubuntu host, install this package, add this code, do this work. Um, that image uh, is then what we we um, we can ship around. I talked about how that's portable. I can then do things like push and pull that around like it was a revision control system. And the Docker team provides a a, a software as a service called the Docker Hub and it can store these images. So I can build a, 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 no, an Apache server and I can push that image up to the Docker Hub and then share that with other people. Uh, I can either do that, it, it operates very much like GitHub, so it has both public repositories, public collections of images, and then private organization level images. So if you're an organization where you don't want to share your image with other people except your team, you can have organizations and teams and things like that. The Docker Hub is also available as an open source product, so you can actually run that behind your firewall. And uh, I'm expecting that in the not too distant future, um, you will actually, Docker will sell a product that is an on-premise version of that Docker Hub that will allow you to keep all of your images behind the firewall if you're obviously not allowed to share applications outside the firewall. And those images are what you create containers from. Since what happens is that, that you build an image and then you, you point Docker at the image and say, run a container from this image. And what it does is it spawns a, a container from that image, um, and essentially what it does is that image is a file system, and it's a read-only file system. And when Docker runs a container, it creates a read-write layer on top of that file system that is your runtime. So when you quit the container, and this is why it's so fast, it, it, it basically shuts down that, 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 that read-write file system and goes back to being an inert container. Um, and uh, an inert image rather. So uh, here's a, an example of a, of a Docker file. Um, and we're gonna take this Docker file, um, oops, uh, which is not letting me cut and paste. Um, uh, excuse me for a moment, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut and paste this, uh, this Docker file. Sorry guys, I, just, uh, my, I didn't realize my slides have stopped it and letting me cut and paste. Um, and we're gonna go onto a machine I built earlier. And we're going to, um, we're going to create a Docker file and we're gonna build this image. And I'm gonna, I'll step you through what this looks like. Um, since what here we have up here is, is um, this from part, Docker images uh, have an inheritance model, and essentially what we're saying here is that I, I want to create um, from what we call a base image. In this case, base image is Ubuntu. So essentially this is I'm going to build an Ubuntu machine. I could also say build a Red Hat machine, or I could inherit from an image I'd already built. So a classic example here is that if I have a, a particular way we build Red Hat machines, I would build an image um, that, that uh, looks like my Red Hat build, like my it, maybe it's my security team has hardened it, or I've configured my DNS servers, or what happens to me, and then I could say, from uh, my company, you know, rel image. We have a maintainer line, and the maintainer line essentially is, um, is uh, like a bit of a shorthand to, to allow you to, um, uh, allow you to sort of say, this is, this is, my, um, this is my image, and, and I, you know, I can find the person who built it. And then we have these run instructions. The run instructions essentially perform actions. They run commands. In this case, we're running app get update, um, and we're um, installing the Apache. Apache um, and then we're going to add, which is the, uh, uh, another command we are available to us, which adds files into the image. Um, and then environment sets environment variables. 
um, volume mounts volumes, so it's like a, it's very much like the mount command. Expose exposes ports, and these last two commands say tell us what what am I going to run when uh, when I have um, uh, when I might create my container from this image. In this case, I'm going to run the Apache daemon, and I'm going to run in the foreground, um, and uh, that that's essentially my Docker file. That's you know, Docker files can be slightly complex, but this is probably a, a reasonably solid example of a, a simple application server. So I mentioned before that we've got a, a, an index.html we're going to add in there. That's going to be our, our application. You could say this could be our source code. So I'm going to create that file now too. So I'm going to create a very simple um, I have to excuse my typing, it's very late in the evening here. I've been typing all day and I'm incredibly clumsy when I'm doing this. So we've created our index file and we can see that our Docker file. I'm now going to build a Docker image from this. And I run the docker build command to do that. And I give my, my build a name. And I, I prefix this name. Uh, docker images have what's called namespaces. And there's essentially like a, like pretty much like a user on GitHub. It's just a way of collecting things together. And I'm going to call it DB. Um, yeah. And then if I run this, it's going to execute that file. So we can see it's starting to take the steps. It says from Ubuntu. It's used that base image. You see each of these layers has a little hash. Um, and it's got, sorry, it's going to go past the screen a little bit. We'll, we'll just let it go for a little moment. These red arrow messages are really because I'm running, um, I'm running these commands uh, interactively, and it doesn't like it. You can see at the end here, it says it's built this little hash. And this is how Docker identifies its images. I talked about it being like a little like, like a version control system. This is essentially a, a Docker image. I can then go Docker images and I should be able to see Jam201 VBB. And I can see it's 223 megabytes. So you can see that it's, you know, even though it is effectively an Ubuntu instance, uh, it's only 223 megabytes because it only has the pieces of Ubuntu. It's like a thin skin of the operating system that it needs to fake out being a, an operating system because it relies on the operating system underneath it, that, that operating system of virtualization to provide all of the magic, all of the interaction with you know, networks and memory and CPU. So we jump back to our slides. We've built our image. Um, I, might, I might just quickly show you, because um, someone asked um, what happens when you change an image. So I go back to my Docker file here, and I've decided I want to add an environment variable. Um, and I'm going to call this one um, test, and the value of, of testing. Um, and I could add a new file, I could create another thing, and maybe I can, I'll, I'll, install a, I'll also install another package. When I rebuild my image, and this is I'm going to run the docker build command again, it'll re-execute this Docker file. And you'll see that it's stopped here. And above it, you see it says using cache. The Docker build process is cached. So essentially what it means is it only change the things that you tell it to change. In this case, it's going to install Vim. Um, it's going to reinstall uh, Apache. And it's going to run my other commands, including add my environment variable. Um, but it's not going to do, it's not going to do any, it, 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 it's provided a, a much faster rebuild experience. And I can, you take advantage of this cache layer to do things like uh, add my source code at the very last minute or changes to my source code. So it never changes the base dependencies. It just rebuilds with a new source code. If you were thinking about running a continuous integration tool, uh, instead of having to rebuild the virtual machine when I busted it, like by running my destructive testing, um, I only have to re rebuild the, the, the new version of the source code or the new release. So, um, here, I'm going to jump back to the slides. Um, we're going to, uh, we've run this docker build command to create our image. Uh, I can then do a, a docker push. And so I talked about before about sharing the image. I could then tell my team I've built, I've built a new version of the application. I'm going to do docker push. I'm going to push it up to the docker hub. And the rest of my team can then do the docker pull command and get a copy of that image. But I'm now going to actually run 
our, our website and, and we're going to see it at work. So um, let's jump back to our command line. So we got some more questions. Sure. Um, so the first one is, um, is Docker open source or is it licensed? If so, how is it licensed? Sure, it's open source under the Apache 2 license. Um, uh, you can, look, there, there are a number of, um, uh, essentially what, essentially what docker.com does, the Docker team, um, they manage the open source project and they sell tools that are built on top of Docker, like the Docker Hub, but the actual core of Docker is entirely open source Apache license. Okay, and so if you need to revert back, let's say you made a mistake or something, how do you go back to the original state? I usually just rebuild the image, um, like it, it, but I can also do things like, um, like each one of those steps in there is, is a layer, so I can actually put breakpoints in there, or if something goes wrong with the image, it'll stop at that layer, I can go back, I can run a container from the image where it is there, and I can see what went wrong, um, and I can, I can you know, fix the problem and keep going. So, so it's that, very flexible. Is that similar to maybe like snapshots in VMware? It is a little bit like that, but probably not quite as sophisticated. Um, in Well, I don't know actually, it's a long time since I did look at um, VMware snapshotting, but um, it is a bit like that, except probably a little bit faster maybe. Like it's okay. not, it's not. Um, uh, you're only copying. Because remember that that the image I created is very small, so that each layer is probably only you know it's only as big as the change that's inside it. So if that layer is just adding that index.html file, it's only like you know, ten bytes long or whatever, which means it's, I'm not snapshotting you know the whole VM. I'm just snapshotting that one layer. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's go back and actually run our machine. So we run, this, this essentially is going to run our Docker image. Um, I'm going to give my container a name. I'm going to call it my website. Uh, I'm going to run it interactively. This was the TI part. Um, I'm going to map a port. I remember I, you may have seen one of the commands earlier inside the, the Docker file was called expose. This basically tells Docker that the application inside this machine is going to, in Docker container, is going to run on port 80. So I'm going to, here's I'm actually doing a port mapping. I'm saying, Port map port 80 inside the container to port 80 outside the container. If I didn't specify port 80 outside the container, Docker would just choose a random high port and, and would present your applications on that. Um, and what did I call it? Uh, the, the, uh, and this is, I, I, as I said, I did warn you earlier about demos. This is the part of the demo that's likely to go disastrously wrong. So we'll uh, see what happens. Uh, and as I said, I've gone disastrously wrong. Um, Lock directory, bid file, that's not good. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to run, uh, I created an image earlier just to test this. So I'm just going to run this one and see whether hopefully we should, uh, we should be all right with this one. Ah, whoops, sorry, I created an, already created an image um, called my website, so I just need to delete that one. And since what I've done there is I've done Docker RM, which is uh, deleting my existing container. I'm just going to try and run it again. Okay, that's better. Um, so this is a, an image I created earlier from the same Docker file. I think I must have fixed whatever the, the, the bug was there. And I can see that um, it's running interactively, so it's presenting everything on the on the line here, and it's saying um, it's essentially it started uh, Apache. So I'm going to go to my browser, and uh, let's have a look at my browser. And this is the, should hopefully be the, uh, actually I don't know what the host is. Uh, so I'm just going to have to check an IP address here. Um, uh, I think this is the right IP address. Uh, I just spun this machine up earlier, so um, uh, I just want to make sure I've got the right IP address. It wouldn't be a demo if something didn't go wrong, right? Correct. So this is this this is the IP address of that. Um, this is a box running in DigitalOcean. It's a DigitalOcean VPS box, um, and uh, I'm now seeing um, my um, my running uh, Apache website. 
If you can think about this, the Apache website is an incredibly simple example here. This could be a, um, you know, a, a WordPress instance or a JVM application or an API endpoint or, whatever, or a message bus, whatever it happens to be. Um, if I wanted to change this, and I, 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 would just, I could just make a change to my index.html, rebuild my Docker image and go from there. Um, actually, let's, let's see if we can do that because I'm, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little bit. I'll show you that process. So, um, whoops, delete. I'm going to delete the, the container I just created. So, uh, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to edit my Docker file. Now, I, I'm just going to make a quick change here to base it on the on the machine I just used because um, I know this one works. We don't need to do any of this anymore because we've already done that. And I, I said this is an inheritance model. So in the VBrown bag machine, I've already um, I've already installed Apache and I've already told it what to do. So um, I don't need to do any of this other stuff. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to keep my thing because I want to add a new version of the of the application or my website in here. So if I go into here, uh, you remember that this is the text I wrote. Um, we want to update that. So I go Docker build. Uh, It made the one change, so you see that it basically has inherited the previous image, and it's made one change to it, created that layer. That layer, you know, is, is obviously now incredibly small, and I can then now run this machine again. Uh, this new machine, uh, hopefully not go to that. And if I go back to my web page, I can see that the message has changed because I've updated my source code. Uh, I, if you're a developer. This is incredibly easy. I can not only can I in rebuild my image with my source code in it, but because I can actually do things like file mounting, I can actually mount my source code inside my Docker container. So I'm changing my I've got my Sublime editor open. I'm changing my web application, and I'm sitting on the browser and hitting refresh and watching the changes happen in real time, without me having to restart a test machine, without me having to rebuild something, without me having to run a tool like Pow or um, or some, you know, or some sort of local display, local server. I'm actually seeing my application run using the same stack it's going to look like in production, and I can see the changes in real time. A, a level of consistency that creates is incredible, um, and developers love it. I absolutely, go nuts for it. So I'm going to jump back to my slides. Um, some of you are saying at this point, probably, or well, hopefully, some of you are saying um, that's one container, right? Um, that doesn't really tell you a really great story. Um, it, you know, it, 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 we don't have very many single instance applications. Um, and it's quite true, it's not easy to build a stack. And that's why um, the Docker team has, has introduced a tool called Fig, um, which does multi-stack things. I'm going to show you how that works now. Um, so Fig, which I, I believe is going to be renamed to Docker Compose in a future release. Um, they're trying to standardize some of the naming. Um, it allows you to build fast and isolated development environments using Docker. It's really quick and easy to use, and essentially what it does, it provides you with an abstraction layer that builds a stack of containers. So instead of one container, like that Docker run command, it provides you with a way to run multiple containers. Um, essentially, installing Fig is really easy. You install Docker, you install Fig, you install it via binary, or you can install it via pip. So we're just going to jump in, use pip install um, to Whoops, pip. Uh, whoops. I'm, I'm just going to delete my old container by the way because I'm, I'm cleaning up after myself. So we um, have a uh, pip a install. Question. Yep. Sorry. Um, so you've added Vim. Uh, let's see. You've added Vim, so it added to the build. If you remove Vim from the config file, will it be removed? Yes. So if I if I go back to that Docker file and then I delete Vim off that line, when Docker gets to it, it will say, "Ah, you've changed that instruction." And it'll rerun it, and this time it'll only install in Apache. But it doesn't do an uninstall because it rebuilds the whole image from that point onwards. Essentially, what you're doing is you're saying to it, like in step step one, I'm going to keep that the same. Step two is the same. Step three, oh, there's a change. I'm going to rebuild the image from that point. Um, but you remember, you're only changing the, that that one thing, so it's very lightweight and very fast. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, and this is the process. It's very simple. Um, you put those in familiar with Python pip. It's just a packaging system for Python. Um, and we've installed fig, and we should be able to say fig help. Yep. Okay. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a. What we do is we build applications with Docker files. So we, we saw the Docker file earlier. I would make four or five of those I would, with my stack in them, and I would create images from them, and then I combine them with what we call a fig yaml file. The fig yaml file is this abstraction um, layer. And here, for example, is a Docker file that installs Postgres. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, sure this is not going to work very well. Um, okay. Um, and then I'm just going to have to try and, and this fig yaml file will essentially run my Postgres image, and it's going to run this demo. And this demo is going to have a rack, a, a, a Rails application inside it. And what this does is it says, I want to create you to create me a container with Postgres in it and open up port 5432 to run um, Postgres on it. Then I want you to create me a new container called web. I'm going to run this new image, which is my application, my Rails application, and map a port, and then I'm going to link that container to my database container. So essentially, I'm able to create a whole stack here. And I, I'm able to do things like, if you have a three-tier web application or a multi-tier API service, um, I can create all of those separate Docker images and I can link them together. So we're just gonna we're just gonna create this FigYaml file. I'm just gonna duck into the editor because I need to cut and paste again. And we can see I have my well, with this top image this top container here is called database. It uses the Postgres image, and the Postgres image is a base image that's available in Docker Hub, and it basically has the best practice install of a Postgres database. Opens up a port, and we have a second container called web, and it uses this James Rowe one fig demo, um, and then uh, we're going to launch our Rails application. We should be able to see that on port 3000, and it's going to use as its database um, the, uh, the Postgres server. So in order to do that, I go fig up. Uh, whoops. Am I going? Right on there. Um, oh, I suspect I don't know what I've done. I've lost all my formatting. Sorry, the file is YAML, so it, it, it has a, a heart attack if you're not. Um, it's not a, let's make sure this should work better, I think. Yep. So what it's doing now is it's running my database machine. You can see it's, it's, um, it's launching a, um, a Postgres database. And then it's running a web, this web container, web1, and it's running webbrick to run Rails. Now I should be able at this point to flip over to my browser and now see a, a running Rails application on this port. Yeah, so this is um, one I built for a demonstration a couple of weeks ago, um, and essentially I could inside that container is a that's a fully functional Rails application. Uh, so I can provide this fig YAML file and the various images it uses, like the database and the Rails application server, um, and whatever else I need, memcache, Redis. I can give this stack to my developers, uh, and they can just use it out of the box um, with no. Uh, they don't have to configure anything. They don't have to ask me for anything. All they do is they say, you know, this, the latest fig takes care of the details of downloading the images, building the images, um, and connecting them together and configuring them. All your developers have to do is pop their source code in there and work on it. So, um, fig can build images, can use existing images, can map ports. It can link containers together. Uh, for example, in that instance, I was linking the, the application server to the database container. Um, and it's still single host centric, so it only runs on one machine. You can't create clusters with yet. But one of the next features for um, the fig tool will be to allow you to manage multiple clusters on multiple machines. Uh, so we've started fig. Uh, that was our demo. Uh, it allows you to build complex local stacks. 
very consistent, very shareable, and no more, and this is one of my favorite slides, works fine in dev ops problem now. So because your developers are using a stack, the same stack they're deploying in production, means that what they're building against is, is the reality of the, of the situation, not some variant built by somebody, an intern three, three years ago, that doesn't resemble production, and as a result, you know, what their code won't run in both places. So uh, almost to the end here, I'm just going to talk a little bit more very quickly about uh, um, some of the other things that Docker encourages. Um, Docker, I said before, it encourages a very microservices architecture. Um, it, and one of the reasons that I find that really attractive is that microservices architectures are not only very scalable, but they're componentized. So uh, you know, you know, if you have a large monolithic host that runs lots of services, it has you know, your application, uh, your monitoring system, SSH, your logging system, backup agent, a backup client, whatever it happens to be. Uh, if I do a, a, a patch upgrade or if I change that machine's configuration or if I bust its DNS, um, it can be quite hard for me with multiple running processes and multiple things being configured on that to actually work out what's gone wrong. And I, I know that this sounds unlikely, but we all are familiar with environments where there are very few people that actually understand how particular applications work. And when you make changes to those applications, for example, you may change a firewall rule or a network configuration, sometimes it has unpredictable results because you just don't know how it works. Um, or the person that built it doesn't work there anymore, or whatever it happens to be. By breaking your environment into components, each Docker container only runs one component. So for example, if my monitoring agent is broken or my DNS is broken, inside one container, I can stop that container, rebuild it, fix the problem, and restart that container. Um, I can take it pieces in and out of my infrastructure. A good example here might be I might use New Relic. I would have the New Relic agent inside a container. When I want to upgrade the New Relic agent, I stop that container, rebuild the image, or add a new image with the updated New Relic agent, and restart that container again and make it available. Same with things like logging. So I can componentize things like SSH, uh, as a component in my environment, and I can make that available as a, a bounce server or something like that running in a drop container. Uh, entirely self-contained configuration. I don't need to put um, keys on any machines or worry about everyone's user being in the right place. I can, I can build that as a separate bit of componentry. Um, I can then jump, I can also do uh, manage a container by what we call Docker exec, which essentially opens up the container. In this case, I run a command inside that container. In this case, I'm opening up and creating a bash shell. So I can jump inside the container and configure something or change something and work on it. Um, I can do scheduling and jobs. Docker is a very strongly, uh, because each instance is very small and the runtime is very lightweight, if you do a lot of, say, RESC or, or um, you know, Sidekick or, or whatever, very, very job processing things, Hadoop, MapReduce, um, Docker sending emails, any sort of delayed job sort of process, Docker is perfect for that because the containers start up really fast, they run the job you want and they go away again. They, they leave, and as a result, they don't leave any remnants behind. Uh, it's very simple, very easy. Um, and it's very easy to diagnose, uh, very easy to troubleshoot when, it, when a job doesn't work. Same with logging, I can create a container um, that is just my logging agent or my logging infrastructure, I can switch between logging environments, logging configurations, just by starting and stopping a different container. Um, and this is an example of, um, uh, I can create a new container that, that maps uh, my website container that I created earlier, and I can use it to just, in this case, I can just tail the log file. I could do this much more sophisticated, I could build syslog around this, or logstash, or splunk, a number of people use Splunk agents inside Docker containers and then just hook the, the, the agents to the container that they need to care about. So this really, um, the really interesting part of this is this really encourages and creates that microservices architecture and it sort of, it, it sort of it, it leaves you in a position where that's the default and, and the healthy architecture for you. Obviously not everyone's going to get there um, and, and not, not going to suit everyone's environments. But I think in a lot of cases, microservices are very healthy, and this is a way to get you there. Um, you can also create things that aren't microservices. You saw the stack I created earlier. It's very easy to do the same thing with a bunch of Docker containers. 
I can just create a stack of a web application um, or a stack that is a traditional three-tier you know, web server, application server, database server model. All of those things are, are, are you know, Docker is very flexible. It, it, it allows you to do all that sort of stuff really easily. Um, architecture separates a lot of the more concerns. Don't rebuild your app to change services. You can have different policies in different domains and you can ship lighter apps. Um, and companies like um, Spotify, um, you know, uh, eBay, PayPal, um, Google, um, you know, big web heavy organizations have done this for a long time. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of other organizations, people like you know, banks, insurance companies, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, all sorts of organizations, including the very conservative ones, looking to rebuild the infrastructure in this way because it's more agile um, and it's easy to it's easy to manage. So questions. And of course, as soon as you say questions, we get questions. Um, so having a bunch of web instances running uh, on port 80 in a single Docker host, uh, I uh, see. I assume they have to um, use immortal ports. If so, how are they presented to the outside world to things that load uh, balance? Sure. Um, so I, when I built that port 80 thing, I mapped it deliberately to port 80. Obviously, you wouldn't use that in a production environment. I would just expose the port, and Docker chooses for me a random port number uh, within a specific range. Um, I can configure that range and customize that. Um, and what happens then is that um, uh, I would usually use something like HA Proxy or a, a service management tool. Uh, sorry, a service management tool like Console or Zookeeper or something like that um, to register the container in the service. So I'd say I have a new web instance, um, and it's uh, this application running on port 49148, uh, and then the next one 49149, 49150, so on, uh, and then my load balancer, I, you know, I just I'd have a query, something like Zookeeper, um, and it, it updates the pool of, of available um, web instances to say, ah, oh, there's three new ports available. Um, that's uh, you know that's incredibly easy um, uh, from a couple of different ways. That, that's, a, that's sort of Zookeeper things in a much more production sort of way. But I can also introspect and interrogate the, the running containers to generate a list of the ports that they run on. So I can say, look at all my containers, tell me how many of them are running this application, and how many of them have port 80 exposed inside the container, and what port is that mapped to? And then I can generate a list of that. Um, I've seen people dump that into like a Redis database, or uh, they, can, they even you know uh, use a Puppet or Chef to pull it out and put it into a template, um, or they just you know they manually update DNS. Um, so Docker automatically manages a lot of DNS stuff for you, so you can actually um, you know you can you can actually do stuff like, like I pop all of those details out and I, I just I, you know I, I use I use a, a, a bit of some clever DNS round robining to to function stuff. Um, it really depends on the model. Um, you'll see a lot more tooling from various people, the CoreOS team. Have a tool called etcd, which is a bit like Zookeeper, and another tool called Fleet, um, which does similar sorts of things that helps you manage things. Uh, the guys who wrote Vagrant, Mitchell Hashimoto's HashiCorp, um, have a tool called Console, um, and you know there's obviously Zookeeper, which is very traditional, and there's a bunch of other sort of service management tools. I'm expecting there's going to be a huge explosion in this sort of tooling, um, and I'm also expecting the Docker team will release some stuff that should be pretty cool too. Very good. Any more questions? So I'm just curious um, for everybody out there who, who hasn't uh, had exposure, beside the book, um, any other reference material that you recommend? Yeah, so the docs on the Docker website are really good. The, um, I, I, I wrote some of them, so I'm gonna, I, I will be self-deprecating there. but. Um, uh, the team that maintains the open source application and writes the docs is really wonderful. Um, those guys are, um, you know, everything's very carefully documented. It's really simple. It has a, uh, an introductory guide that sort of steps you through all the pieces of Docker. There's also a tutorial on the Docker website that teaches you how to use the Docker command line. 
and then teaches you how to use uh, Docker files. Um, so both of those tutorials are really useful. I strongly recommend them. I think um, if you go to docker.com, there's a link at the top that says Just try it. Click on that and it should launch the tutorial for you. Um, those are both excellent resources. Uh, my book will hopefully soon not be the only one out there. I, I would be very surprised if O'Reilly and a bunch of other people pack it and all this and uh, are in the process of publishing more books. So if you prefer a, a more traditional tech publisher, um, you know, give it a few months and there'll be some, some other people out there available in the market. There's a lot of blog posts out there. Um, the Docker community is very active. Um, so the Docker ha there's a Docker mailing list. It's a Google group called Docker Users. Um, there's a Docker development group called Docker-Dev, um, and the, the, on Freenode, the, there's an IRC channel called Hash Docker. Um, there's usually like um, I don't know a thousand people in that channel, 1,200 people in that channel. So it's an incredibly active project, uh, and that includes some people who operate Docker at a very large scale. It's a really helpful, friendly community. Uh, if you have a problem, jump in there and ask. Um, it's very friendly to new people. Um, you won't get any, there's no neck beardy Unixy people there who can be mean to you. Um, it is a community that has, is really welcoming and accepts the fact that there are people who are coming new to Docker and some other people are more experienced. Um, uh, strongly recommend you have a look and a play around with Docker. Um, I've given you a very, you know, I've tried to do a little bit of an overview here, um, but uh, you really have to experience it yourself. Um, and I, you know, I strongly recommend you have a play with it. Um, and I, you know, I strongly recommend that you have a conversation with some of your development teams and show them what this is like and get them a chance to play with it. Um, I have a bunch of people, that are engineers that work for me. They love Docker. They think it's really easy to use. Um, even some of the sort of front-end engineers who are not very infrastructure-centric find Docker really simple to use, and they use it to build their own sort of local images and do stuff like that. Um, the fact that those teams no longer have to sort of engage with a sysadmin um, is, is a really sort of, you know, that takes a whole, gives you a whole lot of flexibility and freedom. Good. Um, so we did get another question. Okay. Uh, the management tools don't seem to be matured yet. Anyone ahead of the others? Um, this uh, individual, Joe, is looking from a, uh, a large organization's perspective, so. Totally. Um, uh, look, this is a technology that was released last, last March. Um, last March? March before, I don't know. Um, so it's 18 months old, I guess. Um, it is not um, vCenter or vCAC or vCOps. You know, this is not point and shoot tooling. Um, uh, I, would be, I, I will be stunned if there isn't a bunch of very strong GUI tools released this year. Um, and uh, I think you need to pr probably look at um, what the Docker team is going to release in the next couple of releases, uh, have a look at um, what the CoreOS organization is doing and, and, and how the tools they're building, have a look at Google's Kubernetes. Uh, and I know that there are a number of people who work um, uh, for uh, Ruby Raman, uh, for Raman Saya at, at, at VMware in the management business unit who are uh, in the process of as fast as possible building Docker support into VMware management tools. So I would not be surprised if you can natively do Docker things in vSphere and a lot of API stuff um, in, you know, uh, probably later in the year there'll be some sort of pre-talk about, you know, pre-release and, and I don't know. I'm, I'm sure VMware World next year there'll be some very solid product release around this. So, yep, very young, but the technology is very young. Um, uh, you know, it's obviously not for everybody as a result. Like if you have sysadmins or, and developers who are used to that drag and drop world, um, it's not there yet. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that's very rapidly coming as people start to adopt this. Uh, Platform 9 is also another one to look at. I think they're looking to support Docker um, in, the, in the near future. So that's also another management tool uh, to look out for. Yeah. Um, and you can expect to see work in as much people doing SDN with Docker. Um, uh, storage management with Docker, um, uh, you know, software-defined data center um, sort of stuff with Docker. There's there's there's, there's about a hundred startups out there that have built stuff based on Docker, plus Cisco, HP, Intel, um, VMware. Obviously, very have a very close partnership. Um, uh, Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, CA, IBM has a huge program where they're integrating Docker with a bunch of their software development tools. 
and their software lifecycle management tools. Um, so all of that sort of stuff is, is uh, you know, it's going to be a pretty exciting year. Also, just to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on Joe's question, so what he was looking for was uh, to move tens and thousands of VM uh, to instances over time. So any anything oh, that could okay. help um, Not yet. Uh, um, I think, uh, yeah, not yet would be my most honest, the most honest. I, I have a look at the tools. I would have a look at a Docker machine, Docker Swarm, and Docker Compose, um, which are sort of in, on the cusp of being released, the version ones. Um, that should give you some feel for what's happening and what sort of tooling is going to be built. But there's certainly nothing now that, that it's like, um, you would probably have to build some of your own tooling around thousands of instances. Um, you know, uh, Google Kubernetes is a very, would do some of that stuff, but it's a very new tool. Uh, it does, it's not point and click or it's not manageable. Um, uh, some of the core OS tools uh, have some healthy stuff in them, but again, very young. Um, they're not enterprise grade tools by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, let's see, what is preferred distro to get started uh, playing with Docker? Um, I personally would use Ubuntu 14.04. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but uh, Docker only runs at 64-bit. It's not a 32-bit, it doesn't support 32-bit um, uh, operating system. So Ubuntu 14.04 64-bit. Uh, you can just do app get install docker from the command line. All the, there's lots of documentation about getting started with Docker on Ubuntu. Um, if you're a Red Hat shop, uh, RHEL 7, well supported, um, the, the Red Hat team can help you out with that. They've got some people in house who are working on Docker. Um, they've got a, they're starting to teach the sales and service teams uh, a bit more about Docker. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're in San Francisco or New York, or those teams are probably pretty up, up to speed. Um, but you know, someone in Red Hat will be able to give you support. Um, I believe they shipped some documentation for Docker as well as part of Roll 7. So again, if you've got that available as a distro, I choose Ubuntu because it's like I can run it on DO or um, Amazon really quickly. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Looks like uh, we have no more questions. So with that, James, thank you so much. This was uh, really informative uh, and very helpful. My pleasure. Thanks very much for, for everyone for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. All right. Well, with that, uh, we will end the uh, broadcast. Thank you.